everyone and welcome to a time with the SL. We bless God for his goodness, his mercy, his kindness and his love. We thank him for this beautiful Wednesday. Everlasting Father and all-seeing God, you sent your son as a light to shine in our darkness. Help us to listen to what Jesus is saying to us this evening. Help us, Lord, to act on your word so that rivers of living water might flow from our hearts. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So our word today is very short. It's just titled Grace. Grace. And of course, you know that we are in our season. We are in our season of grace and even more grace. Amen. Amen. Our text is taken from Genesis 45, verses 1 to 15. This is a very popular story, story of Joseph. And we are looking at a message based on the life of Joseph and how Joseph allowed grace to be the rule of his life. Amen. Genesis 45, 1 to 15. Genesis 45, 1 to 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. And he wept. Oh, so there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly. that the Egyptians heard him and all of Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been a famine in the land and the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. For God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, ruler of all of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all that you have. I'll provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves and so can my brother Benjamin that it is really I who I'm speaking to you. Tell my father about the honor, all the honor accorded to me in Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept and Benjamin embraced him weeping and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Truly, the story of Joseph is a story of Amazing grace. Amazing grace. We just need to go back to Genesis 37. And there's a, you know, it's, it's quite, it's not that long a story. So you don't realize that it has taken many years between Genesis 37 
to Genesis 45. Many years have gone by. Joseph was taken as a youth. A young boy. He became ruler of Egypt as an adult man. He suffered. He suffered for many years. Many years. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Lord will deliver them from all. Genesis 37, 3, we are told, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. Genesis 37, 5 to 11 tells us that Joseph multiplied the hatred by telling his dreams. And in those dreams, he shared that his parents and his brothers would bow down to him. Tell your children, you should be careful what they say. Even you, be careful what you say. Be careful who you share your stories with, who you share your dreams and your aspirations with. Many dream killers out there. Why did they try to kill Joseph? Simply out of jealousy and hatred. That was why. There was no other reason. Same thing with Jesus. Why they killed Jesus? It was simply jealousy and hatred. Genesis 37, 19 to 28. We see Joseph being thrown into a pit. Eventually, he's sold as a slave to the Ishmaelites. And they take Joseph down to Egypt. He couldn't speak the language. His fate was pretty much sealed. They were never going to see Joseph again. Never. And Genesis 37, 36 tells us that the Midianites, they sold Joseph to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, quite high up. Genesis 39, 4, we still see the life of Joseph. You see, God has never left Joseph, but also Joseph never left God. Potiphar puts Joseph in charge of his household. Thank God for his grace in our lives. That where the grace of God is, God is himself. The story continues and tells us how Potiphar's wife desired to go to bed with Joseph. But Joseph didn't want that. And he refused. And she then gets angry. She is angered over the rejection she gets angry because Joseph rejected her. God knows how many men in the household of Potiphar this woman had slept with. I don't know if Potiphar knew what his wife was up to. Genesis 39, 7 to 20. His wife claims that Joseph tried to rape her. You know, it's not possible for Potiphar to take Joseph's word against his, over his wife's word. It would never have been possible. It was not going to happen. And so Joseph is cast into prison. Not just any ordinary prison. He's cast into Pharaoh's prison. That was one prison that Joseph was not going to come out of. So the same way his brothers sent him to Egypt guaranteeing him a certain death, that they would never see him again. The same way Potiphar sent him to the, pe to the prison of Pharaoh, assuming that Joseph would never come out alive. But we see the grace of God at work in the life of Joseph. Genesis 40, 5 to 23. And the reason why I'm not reading is so that, especially now that we are in our 21 days, Daniel fast, praying that we will use the opportunity to study this word on our own, get the rema, get what God is talking to us, get the messages that God is giving us. So you will read the word in your spare time. Hallelujah. So while Joseph is in prison, he reveals the interpretation of the two dreams of two prisoners, Potif um, Pharaoh's special prisoners, one was the baker, and the other one was a cupbearer. 
one of them would be restored to his original job and the other one would have his head cut off. And to show you that, even though Joseph had been put in charge, even of the prison, it wasn't fun. Joseph still said, please remember me so that I can be removed from this place. Sometimes we read stories and we think, but Joseph was having a good time in prison. I don't believe anyone can have a good time in prison. Remember I said earlier, between Genesis 37 to Genesis 45, a good number of years have gone past. And when you read Genesis 41, 1 to 37, we see Pharaoh having dreams no one can interpret. But Joseph is able to interpret the dreams because the cupbearer remembers that while he was in prison, there was one young lad, Hebrew boy, and God. Pharaoh said, fetch this boy. Joseph was taken from his father's house forcefully by his brothers. I'd say about 15, 16. Genesis 41, 37 to 46 sees Joseph being promoted to authority next to Pharaoh. At this point in time, he was about 30. About 30. It wasn't just the ability to interpret the dream, but also how he knew what to do with the dream's information, the information that the dream had given. Genesis 41, 9 to 31, please read that as well. Because the dream Joseph interpreted for Pharaoh was that there were going to be seven years of abundance followed by seven years of drought. And Joseph was able to display to Pharaoh far, firm, a firm knowledge of economic planning. You see, this famine was not just going to happen in Egypt, but all the areas around Egypt. Even as far as Canaan, where Jacob and his clan struggled to stay alive because they suffered regarding the same famine. Genesis 41, 42, 1 to 5 tells us that the only place that there was food was Egypt. The only place that there was food was Egypt. And if Jacob's family wanted to survive the famine, they would have to go to Egypt to get grain. And so we see the hand of God. We see it fully at work. The brothers come to Egypt and they have to go before their brother Joseph, but they don't recognize him. How would they ever have recognized him? How would they have ever imagined? How would they have ever imagined that they would encounter Joseph again? How? It was really an impossibility. And we see the dreams coming to play. Genesis 42, 6. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Verse 8. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. They didn't recognize him. And at the point that the brothers recognize Joseph, they are afraid. Who wouldn't be afraid? Have you ever found yourself in that situation? You see someone who you have been mean and nasty to and now they're in a position of authority. And you start wondering, ah, this one going to teach me the lesson of my life today. The brothers are afraid. They are afraid that Joseph is going to exact his revenge on them. They believe they believe that Joseph is going to exact his revenge on them.
And Genesis 45, 3 sees Joseph saying to his brothers, I am Joseph, it's me. It's your brother, Joseph. Can't you recognize me? Is my father still alive? And the Bible tells us that the brothers could not answer because they were scared. They were terrified. They could not believe it. It was as if their worst nightmare had come true. This is such an amazing story. It's an amazing story. Because it just shows that what was inside of Joseph came out. Joseph allowed grace to rule his life. He allowed grace to rule his life. Joseph could have said, Aha, today you guys are in trouble. And I wonder, you know, if when from the point that Joseph realized that they were his brothers, what was going through Joseph's head? He could have brought revenge upon them. Because of the multiple hurts they introduced to his life. You see, this is somebody who was loved dearly by his father. He had a place of privilege at the table at home. But they hated Joseph. And Joseph knew that his brothers hated him. They were jealous of him. For other reasons, as well as because of that coat. That coat. That coat of many colors that Joseph was given by his father, Jacob. They knew that Jacob loved Joseph more than his other sons. They wanted to kill him. You know, we try to tell the story in a nice way. And say they didn't really want to kill him. They wanted to just teach him a lesson. No, they wanted to kill jo Joseph. Because they sold him into slavery. They wanted to kill him. But Joseph allowed grace to rule over his life because he allowed God to be his divine influence. Exactly, we romanticize his story, yeah. Joseph allowed God to be his divine influence. He looked at everything and just said, it can only be God. And perhaps that is why he was able to survive in Potiphar's house. Maybe that's how he was able to survive the journey to Egypt. Able to survive in the jail. By allowing God to be his divine influence. Genesis 15, 19. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Many of us have to change our mindset. Stop personalizing issues. Always realize that there's a macro level. There's always something. There's a reason for something. Joseph knew that God loved him. God will not allow anything to happen to him without a reason. We learn so much about grace today. You see, grace is lived out by offering compassion to the ruthless, to those wicked people, those people that you know will never change. Genesis 45, 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am bro your brother Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. Now don't be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Gosh, what a guy. What a guy. What a guy. So many lessons we learn from the story of Joseph. Grace is lived out by having pity on those who have. 
or had no pity. People who did not intend good for you. It hurt Joseph deeply. It hurt him. Genesis 45 2 tells us, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, what about my dad? What about daddy? Is daddy still alive? Can you imagine all the years that he would have yearned to hear his dad talk? He wanted to hold his dad. Grace is lived out by choosing to offer forgiveness over retribution. Some of us, when we want to, we are going through a challenge. You keep thinking and saying, this is my testimony. I will use it to teach them a lesson. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Genesis 45, 5. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. We learn also that grace is lived out by refusing to allow anger to dictate our actions. Don't do anything in anger. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. When you look back, you see where you are today. And look at where the enemy intended you to be. And you see you're still standing. Genesis 41, 51 to 52. Joseph said, God has made me forget all my trouble. God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Yes, the plan was for you to suffer, but you're not suffering. Why don't you just move on? Overcome that hurdle. You see, the enemy planned one hurdle for you. You overcame it. But mentally, if you still remain to, if you still choose to remain in yesterday, then exactly where the enemy planned for you to be is where you still are. Let grace be the rule of your life. As it was with Joseph, that same rule was also with Jesus. And when you look at the life of both Joseph and Jesus, you see so many similarities. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So we must let grace be lived out by us doing good. We have to do good. It's not in our natural self to do good, but we can do good. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee preaching the good news. Matthew 6, 22. Jesus said, if your eyes be good, your whole body is full of life. Matthew 12, 35. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. He is a good man. Acts 9.36 is the story of Dorcas. She was always good, doing good and helping the poor. How can we show grace? Let grace be spoken by forgiving people. Remember that woman that was caught in adultery? Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So he wasn't condoning her sin. He said she should stop it, but he would not condemn her. Luke 17, 3. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Even in the Lord's Prayer, we are told, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass, who transgress against us. 
Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It's not easy, but you need to get to that point where someone does something and you look at it and it just doesn't make any sense. And because it doesn't make any sense, then you know that they can't know what they are doing truly. Because if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't do it. Beloved, let grace be shared by living that I am willing lifestyle. I am willing to forgive. I am willing to forget. I am willing to overlook. Remember the leper? The leper asked Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said to him, I am willing. So grace is shared when you don't will for anyone to be lost. Jesus Christ said, my will is to seek and save that which is lost. That same grace that is shared says, I am willing to live in harmony with one another. We have to learn not to be proud, but to be willing to associate with people of low position, or perhaps I should say with all people. You see, grace shared is grace with you, grace in you, and grace all over you. Most of the books that Paul wrote, he always closed with grace be with you. And so I pray this evening as we close, that let grace robe you, let grace clothe you in the mighty name of Jesus. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We are so blessed to be called your children. We are so blessed to have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross, pay the price for our sins. Thank you that his resurrection life is ours by grace through faith in him, in Jesus Christ. Amen. We thank you that Christ is the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God. And that we have been given new lives in Christ so that Christ's grace and mercy, in his grace and mercy, we have become more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you, Lord, that we have been given all that we need in this lifetime, everything we need for godliness, and that no matter what difficulties or dangers we may be called upon to face, we have an assurance that God's grace is more than sufficient for all our needs because his strength is made perfect in our weakness. It truly is a privilege to be called a child of God. It is a privilege to have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son simply because of his amazing grace. That grace which has been poured upon us in abundance through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you for being our kinsman redeemer. You became a sin sacrifice so that we would be made right before God. We know our Lord and our God that with all, all that we have, none of us is worthy enough to gather up crumbs under your table. But yet you have clothed us with Jesus Christ's righteousness. Thank you for your amazing grace that has made us children of God and partakers in the high heavenly calling. Father, we are ambassadors of heaven. We pray that we will reflect Christ's beauty and grace to all who come in contact with us. We pray that Jesus Christ is seen in us so that others will be drawn to him. And we pray, Lord, that we will decrease in the sight of others so that Jesus Christ will increase in every single area of our lives. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we thank you that we have received forgiveness of all our sins by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We have redemption through the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you that you are so rich in mercy and grace, in love and forgiveness. Father, we ask this evening that you will empower us to forgive others as Jesus Christ has forgiven us, unconditionally and without any resentment or hidden hurt. We know, Lord, that if it is in our own power, <laughs> we will not be able to forgive some. Some people who have caused up, they've caused up deep pain and anguish of heart. But Father, when we sit and consider what Jesus Christ did and went through for us, when we see how much we have been forgiven by you, we want to be able to forgive others in the same gracious way that you have forgiven us. So Lord, give us the grace to forgive unconditionally, to forgive others as Christ forgave us. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. Glorious Lord, as we depart from this time with you, we ask that you will make your presence known in all our lives, in each individual heart. And through our worship with you, Lord, let us be blessed. And let us learn to remain in your presence. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. We thank you. The ministry thanks you for spending this evening with us. God bless you. Look forward to as many of you who will join us. I know I don't... Yes, join us tomorrow. We have a ministration tomorrow evening. We don't have one on Friday. We have a ministration tomorrow evening. For as many who will join us tomorrow evening for a time with the SL. God bless you. I love you. With the love of the Lord, have a fantastic evening. Stay lifted.